All right. How is everybody doing over here? All right. Thank you for dropping in, Pebs. Uh, sorry that I missed you dropped out there. <laughs> and thank you for the follow, Kira. Um, it's good to see you there. Legal likes to think of their character in ice cream form. I like this idea. We should totally go for it. All right. Chapter 7. A Mad Tea Party There was a table set out under the tree in front of the house, and the March Hare and the Hatter were having tea at it. A Dormouse was sitting between them, fast asleep, and the other two were using it as a cushion, resting their elbows on it, and talking over its head. I'm very uncomfortable for the Dormouse, thought Alice. Only, as it's asleep, I suppose it doesn't mind. Though the table was a large one, but there were three the three were all crowded together at one corner of it. No room, no room they cried out when they saw Alice coming. And there's plenty of room, said Alice indignantly, and she sat down in a large armchair at one end of the table. Have some wine, the March Hare said in an encouraging tone. Alice looked all round the table, but there was nothing on it but tea. I don't see any wine, she remarked. Well, there isn't any, said the March Hare. <laughs> then it isn't very civil of you to offer it. It wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. I didn't know it was your table. It's laid for a great many more than three. Your hair wants cutting, said the Hatter. He had been looking at Alice for some time with great curiosity, and this was his first speech. You should learn not to make personal remarks. It's very rude. <sighs> the Hatter opened his eyes very wide on hearing this, but all he said was, Why is a raven like a writing desk? Come, we shall have some fun now, thought Alice. I'm glad they've begun asking riddles. I believe I can guess that, she added aloud. <sighs> Thank you for the support, Legal. I'm glad you're recognizing all my wonderful chatters. Do you mean that you think you can find out the answer to it? Said the March Hare. Exactly so, said Alice. Then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit. You might just as well say I see what I eat is the same as I eat what I see. You might just as well say, added the March Hare, that I get like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You might just as well say, added the Dormouse, who seemed to be talking in his sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing with you, said the Hatter, and here the conversation dropped and the party sat silent for a minute while Alice thought over all she could remember about ravens and writing desks, which wasn't much. <laughs> I'm glad you're settling in to be comfy, Caffrey. And Queen, you're also fantastic. I'm glad you're getting a warm reception here tonight because you are absolutely delightful. The Hatter was the first to break the silence. What day of the month is it? He said, turning to Alice. He had taken his watch out of his pocket and was looking at it uneasily, shaking it every now and then and holding it to his ear. Alice considered a little and then said, The fourth? Two days wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Two days wrong, said the Hatter. I told you butter wouldn't suit the works, he added, looking angrily at the March Hare. It was the best butter. Yes, but some crumbs must have got in as well. You shouldn't have put it in with the bread knife. <laughs> Thank you for the blessings. The March Hare look, took the watch and looked at it gloomily. Then he dipped it into his cup of tea and looked at it again, but could think of nothing better to say than his first remark. 
It was the best butter, you know. Alice had been looking over his shoulder with the, some curiosity. What a funny watch, she remarked. It tells the day of the month and doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not, but that's because it stays the same year for such a long time together. Which is just the case with mine, said the Hatter. Alice felt dreadfully puzzled. The Hatter's remark seemed to have no sort of meaning in it, and yet it was certainly English. I don't quite understand you, she said as politely as she could. The Dormouse is asleep again, said the Hatter, and he poured a little hot tea upon its nose. The Dormouse shook its head impatiently and said without opening its eyes, of course, of course, just what I was going to remark for myself. Have you guessed the riddle yet? The Hatter said, again turning to Alice. Uh, no, I give up. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea. Nor I. Alice sighed wearily. I think you might do something better with the time. And wasted asking riddles that have no answers. If you knew what... If you knew time as well as I do, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't know what you mean. Of course you don't, said the Hatter, tossing his head contemptuously. I dare say you never even spoke to time. Oh no, I just caught what he's saying. Hello, B. It's good to see you. The Mad Hatter is criticizing Alice for getting Time's pronouns wrong. I... I know this is technically just a reference to Latin, but still, we have evidence going back hundreds of years that people misgendering Concepts like time is a thing. I... Happy Pride Month, everybody. Happy Pride Month. <laughs> Perhaps not, but I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah, that accounts for it. He won't stand beating. Now, if only you kept on good terms with him, he'd do almost anything you liked with the clock. For instance, suppose it were nine o'clock in the morning, just time to begin lessons. You'd only have to whisper a hint to time, and round goes the clock in a twinkling half past one time for dinner. I only would like it if it were, said the March Hare to itself in a whisper. Well, that'd be grand, certainly, but then I shouldn't be hungry for it, you know? Oh, not at first, perhaps, but you could keep it half past one as long as you liked. Is that the way you manage? The Hatter shook his head mournfully. Not I. We quarreled last March, just before he went mad, you know, pointing with his teaspoon at the March Hare. It was the great concert given by the Queen of Hearts, and I had to sing, Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder where you're at. Hey, you know the song, perhaps? I've heard something like it. Goes on, you know, in this way. Up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle. Here the Dormouse shook itself and began to sing in its sleep. Twinkle, 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 twinkle. And it went on so long that they had to pinch it to make it stop. There you go, Rage. Have a head pat, cutie. Well, okay, that's... I shouldn't be calling you cute. That was my bad, and I am sorry for that. We've already had that conversation. Well, I'd hardly finished the first verse when the queen jumped up off and bawled out, He's murdering the time! Off with his head! How dreadfully savage! And ever since that, the, the Hatter went on in a mournful tone, he won't do a thing I ask. It's always six o'clock now. 
a bright idea came to Alice's head. Is that the reason you so many tea things are put out here? Yes, that's it. It's always tea time and we've no time to wash things between whiles. And then you keep moving round, I suppose? Exactly so, as things get used up. But what happens when you come to the beginning? Suppose we change the subject. The March Hare interrupted, yawning. I'm getting tired of this. I vote the young lady tells us a story. I'm afraid I don't know one, said Alice, rather alarmed at the proposal. Then the Dormouse shall, they both cried. Wake up, Dormouse! And they pinched it on both sides at once. <laughs> okay, so, Caffrey, with respect to human constructs of intangible concepts like time having a gender, is actually more a reference to ling language and linguistics. So, in English, there are three genders that are typically used for objects. There's the masculine, he, him, feminine, she, her, which is also often applied to vessels for some reason, and uh, it, or its, the neuter gender. Um, but in many languages, the masculine and feminine apply to places where English uses a neutral gender. So, uh, for example, giraffe, feminine in French. Um, so it's actually, in those cases, a feature of the language rather than an indication of biology or particular pronoun preference for something or other. So that is how we end up with genders for things that are genderless. And in this particular case, Lewis Carroll was making a reference to Latin, and that in Latin, the word for time is a masculine noun. So you use very specific uh, changes to the word depending on whether it's a subject, an object, an indirect object, etc. The Dormouse slowly opened its eyes. Well, was it asleep? He said in a hoarse, feeble voice. I heard every word you fellows were saying. Tell us a story. Yes, please do. And be quick about it, or you'll be asleep again before it's done. <laughs> Once upon a time, there were three little sisters, and their names were Elise, Stacy, and Tilly, and they lived at the bottom of a well. Oh, what did they live on? said Alice, who always took a great interest in questions of eating and drinking. Given how much she's eaten and drink and drank throughout this story, I, I don't think I can blame her for being particularly interested in food. They lived on a treacle, said the Dormouse after thinking a minute or two. They couldn't have done that, you know. They'd have been ill. So they were very ill. Alice tried to fancy herself. What's such an extraordinary way of they living would be like, but it puzzled her too much, so she went on. But why did they live at the bottom of a well? Take some more tea, the March Hare said to Alice very earnestly. I've had nothing yet, Alice replied in an offended tone, so I can't take more. You mean you can't take less? It's very easy to take more than nothing. Nobody asked your opinion. Uh, grammatical gender is the word that you're looking for, Caffrey. Hello, Captain Flog. Thank you very much for dropping in. It's good to see you. Who's making personal remarks now? The Hatter asked triumphantly. Alice did not quite know what to say to this, so she helped herself to some tea and bread and butter and then turned to the Dormouse and repeated her question. Why did they live at the bottom of a well? The Dormouse again took a minute or two to think about it, and then said, It was a trickle well. There's no such thing. Alice was beginning very angrily, but the Hatter and March Hare went, Shh, shh. And the Dormouse sulkily remarked, If you can't be civil, you'd better finish the story yourself. 
No, please go on, Alice said very humbly. I won't interrupt again. I dare say there may be one. One indeed, said the Dormouse indignantly. However, he consented to go on. And so these three little sisters, they were learning to draw, you know. What did they draw? Asked Alice, quite forgetting her promise. Trickle, said the Dormouse, without considering at all this time. I want a clean cup, interrupted the Hatter. Let's all move one place on. He moved on as he spoke, and the Dormouse followed him. The March Hare moved on to the Dormouse's place, and Alice rather unwillingly took the place of the March Hare. The Hatter was the only one who got any advantage from the change, and Alice was a good deal worse off than before, as the March Hare had just upset the milk jug into his plate. You're right that gendered language is common in Spanish and French. They are both Latin derivatives. Alice did not wish to offend the Dormouse again, so she began very cautiously, But I don't understand. Where did they draw the trickle from? Uh, you can draw water out of wa a water well. So I should think you should draw a trickle out of a trickle well, eh, stupid? They were in the well, said Alice to the Dormouse, not choosing to notice this last remark. Of course they were. Well in. This answer so confused poor Alice that she let the Dormouse go on for some time without interrupting it. They were learning to draw. <sighs> the Dormouse went on, yawning and rubbing its eyes, for it was getting very sleepy. And they drew all manner of things, everything that begins with a nem. Why an M? Why not? Alice was silent. The Dormouse had closed its eyes by this time and was going off into a doze, but on being pinched by the Hatter, it woke up again with a little shriek and went on. <laughs> that begins with an M, such as mouse traps in the moon and memory and muchness. You know, they say that there are much of a muchness. Did you ever see such a thing as a drawing of a muchness? Really, now you ask me, said Alice, very much confused. I don't think... Then you shouldn't talk, said the Hatter. This piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. The Dormouse fell asleep instantly, and neither of the others took the least notice of her going, though she looked back once or twice, half hoping that they would call after her. The last time she saw them, they were trying to put the Dormouse into the teapot. At any rate, I'll never go there again, said Alice as she picked her way through the wood. It's the stupidest tea party I ever was at in my life. Just as she said this, she noticed that one of the trees had a door leading right into it. That's very curious, she thought, but everything's curious today. I think I may as well go in at once. And in she went. Once more, she found herself in the long hall and close to the little glass table. Now I'll manage better this time, she said to herself, and began taking the little golden key and unlocking the door that led into the garden. Then she went to work nibbling at the mushroom. She had kept a piece of it in her pocket till she was about a foot high. Then she walked down... Uh, sorry, I lost my place. Then she walked down the little passage, and then she found herself at last in the beautiful garden among the bright flower beds and the cool fountains. All right, I need just a moment here. I will be back very quickly.
and it turns out I was muted. Hello, Raiders. Hello, Tiny Foxtrot. And thank you so much, everybody. My name is Lynn Heidelman. I am a voice actress and uh, <laughs> I read stories for my stream here. Uh, tonight we are reading Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. We have just finished with the Mad Tea Party. Uh, which left a riddle unanswered and a story unfinished. And we are just about to start the Queen's Croquet. So, uh, thank you everybody for joining in. Uh, if you haven't already, please do follow Fo Tiny Foxtrot. Uh, she's absolutely a delightful person. Uh, one of a collective group that call themselves the Horror Thoughts. Uh, they are often do streams um although i haven't seen them do anything particularly recently and tiny stuff is very uh gentle very encouraging uh, it's just a fun time all around <laughs> so uh came in at the end uh i'm not quite certain i understand naruto <laughs> Well, Tiny, if I'm kind, it's because you deserve it. So. Uh, no, I'm not ending. I just got back from a brief break, and we are about to continue with the story, Naruto. But I'm glad that you dropped in. Uh, we've already read through the Terms of Service for Twitch, um, so if you want to check out the VOD for that, I will have that up later here. Apparently it takes a solid hour to get through, so expect that it might take a little bit. Um, but yes, we have read the entire Terms of Service. <sighs> uh, and yes, with that, we have entered the Queen's Croquet Ground. A large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses were growing on it were white, but there were three gardeners at it, busily painting them red. Alice thought this a very curious thing, and she went nearer to watch them. Just as she came up to them, she heard one of them say, Look out now, Five! Don't go splashing paint on me like that! I couldn't help it, said Five in a sulky tone. Seven jogged my elbow. On which Seven looked up and said, That's right, Five. Always lay the blame on others. You'd better not talk, said Five. I've heard the Queen say only yesterday you deserve to be beheaded. What for? said the one who had spoken out first. It's none of your business, too. Yes, it is his business. I'm mixing these up so badly, I'm sorry. That's none of your business, too. Yes, it is his business, and I'll tell him it was for bringing the cook tulip roots instead of onions. <laughs> yeah, not like Twitch follows the TOS, and I might have actually violated Twitch's TOS by reading the Twitch TOS on stream. So, uh, we'll see what happens as a result of that. <laughs> Seven flung down his brush and had just begun... Well, of all the unjust things, when his eye chanced to fall upon Alice as she stood watching them, and he checked himself suddenly. The others looked round also, and all of them bowed low. Would you tell me, said Alice a little timidly, why are you painting these roses? Five and seven said nothing but looked at two. Two began in a low voice. Why, the fact is, you see, miss, uh, this here ought to have been a red rose tree. And while we put a white one in by mistake, and if the queen finds out, uh, was to find out, we should all have our heads cut off, you know. So, uh, you see, miss, we're doing our best before she comes to... At this moment, Five, who had been anxiously looking across the garden, called out, The queen! The queen! <laughs> and the three gardeners instantly threw themselves flat upon their faces. There was the sound of many footsteps, and Alice looked round, eager to see the queen. First came ten soldiers carrying clubs. These were all shaped like the three gardeners, oblong and flat, with their hands and their feet at the corners. Next, in the ten courtiers, 
These were ornamented all over with diamonds, and walked two and two as the soldiers did. After these came the royal children, there were ten of them, and little deers came jumping merrily along hand in hand and coupled. They were all ornamented with hearts. Next came the guests, mostly kings and queens, and among them Alice recognized the white rabbit. It was talking in a hurried, nervous manner, smiling at everything that was said, and went by without noticing her. Then followed the knave of hearts, carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion. And last of all, this grand procession came the king and queen of hearts. Alice was rather doubtful whether she ought not to lie down on her face like the three gardeners, but she could not remember ever having heard of such a rule at processions. And besides, what would be the use of a procession if all people had to lie down upon their faces they couldn't see it? So she stood still where she was and waited. When the procession came opposite to Alice, they all stopped and looked at her, and the queen said severely, Who is this? She said it to the knave of hearts, who only bowed and smiled in reply. Idiot, said the queen, tossing her head impatiently and turning to Alice, she went on. What is your name, child? My name is Alice, so please your majesty, said Alice very politely, but she added to herself, Why, they're only a pack of cards, after all. I needn't be afraid of them. And who are these? said the queen, pointing to the three gardeners who were lying round the rose tree. For, you see, as they were lying on their faces, and the pattern on their backs was the same as the rest of the pack, she couldn't tell whether they were gardeners or soldiers or courtiers or three of her own children. How should I know? said Alice, surprised at her own courage. It's no business of mine! The queen turned crimson with fury, and after glancing at her for a moment like a wild bee, screamed, off with her head! Off! Nonsense! said Alice very loudly and decidedly, and the queen was silent. The king laid his hand upon her arm and timidly said, Consider, my dear, she is only a child. The queen angrily turned away from him and said to the knave, Turn them over! The knave did so, carefully, with one foot. Get up! said the queen in a shrill, loud voice, and the three gardeners instantly jumped up and began bowing to the king, the queen, the royal children, and everybody else. Leave off that, said, screamed the queen. You make me giddy! And with, then, turning to the rose tree, she went on, What have you been doing here? Um, here, please, your majesty, said Sue in a very humble tone, going down on one knee as he spoke. We were trying... Oh, I see, said the queen, who had meanwhile been examining the roses. Off with their heads! And the procession moved on, three of the soldiers remaining behind to execute the unfortunate gardeners, who ran to Alice for protection. You shan't be beheaded, said Alice, as she put them into a large flower pot that stood near. The three soldiers wandered around for a minute or two, looking for them, and then quietly marched off after the others. All the heads off? The heads are gone, if you should please your majesty, the soldier shouted in reply. Oh, that's right. Can you play croquet? The soldiers were silent and looked at Alice as the question was evidently meant for her. Yes, shouted Alice. Oh, come on then, roared the queen, and Alice joined the procession, wondering very much what would happen next. It's, it's a very fine day said a timid voice at her side. She was walking by the white rabbit, who was peeping anxiously into her face. Very nice, said Alice. Well, where's the duchess? Hush, hush, said the rabbit in a low, hurried tone. He looked anxiously over his shoulder as he spoke, and then raised himself up on tiptoe, put his mouth close to her ear, and whispered, She's under sentence of execution. What for? Did you say... What a pity? No, I didn't. I don't think it's at all a pity. I said, what for? She boxed the queen's ears, said the rabbit. Oh, 
Hello, Lexi. I'm glad you've decided to drop in, even if you are out with family. It's lovely to see you. I hope you get a good chance to lurk. He boxed the queen's ears, the rabbit began. Alice gave a scream of laughter. Oh, hush! The rabbit whispered in a frightened tone. The queen will hear you. You see, she's rather late, and the queen said, Get to your places! shouted the queen in a voice of thunder, and people began running about in all directions, tumbling up against each other. However, they got settled down in a minute or two, and the game began. Alice thought she had never seen such a curious croquet ground in her life. It was all ridges and furrows. The balls were live hedgehogs, the mallets live flamingos, and the soldiers had to double themselves up to stand on their hands and feet to make the arches. The chief difficulty Alice found at first was in managing her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away comfortably enough under her arm with its legs hanging down. But generally, just as she had got its neck nicely straightened out and was going to give the hedgehog a blow with its head, it would twist itself round and look up at her face, with such puzzled expression that she could not help bursting out laughing. And when she had got its head down and was going to begin again, it, it was very provoking to find that the hedgehog had unrolled itself and was in the act of crawling away. Besides all this, there was generally a ridge or furrow in the way wherever she wanted to send the hedgehog to, and up and walking off to other parts of the ground, Alice soon came to the conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. The players all played at once without waiting for turns, quarreling all the while and fighting for the hedgehogs, and in a very short time the queen was in a furious passion and went stamping about and shouting, Off with his head! Or, Off with her head! about once per minute. Sonic the Hedgehog? I don't know. I hope it doesn't go fast, or if it does, that it wants to go through the hoops. Croquet is not something easy to play at, you know, near light speed. So. <laughs> Alice began to feel very uneasy. To be sure, she had not as yet had any dispute with the Queen, but she knew that it might happen any minute. And then, thought she, what would become of me? They're dreadfully fond of beheading people here. The great wonder is that there's anyone left alive. She was looking about for some way of escape and wondering whether she could get away without being seen when she noticed a curious appearance in the air. It puzzled her very much at first, but after watching it a minute or two, she made it out to be a grin, and she said to herself, It's the Cheshire Cat. Now I shall have somebody to talk to. How are you getting on? Said the cat as soon as there was mouth enough for it to speak with. Alice waited till its eyes appeared, then nodded. It's no use speaking to it, she thought, till its ears have come, or at least one of them. In another minute the whole head appeared, and then Alice put down her flamingo and began an account of the game, feeling very glad she had someone to listen to her. The cat seemed to think that there was enough of it now in sight, and no more of it appeared. "'I don't think they play at all fairly,' Alice began in a rather complaining tone. "'And they all quarrel so dreadfully one can't hear oneself think, speak. "'And they don't seem to have any rules in particular. "'At least if there are, nobody attends to them, "'and you've no idea how confusing it is. "'All the things that being alive, for instance, there's the arch I've got to—' through, next walking about the other end of the ground, and I should have croqueted the queen's hedgehog just now, only it ran away when it saw mine coming. How do you like the queen? said the cat in a low voice. Not at all. She's so extremely... Just then she noticed the queen was close behind her listening, so she went on, likely to win, that it's hardly worth finishing the game. The queen smiled and passed on. "'Who are you talking to?' said the king, going up to Alice and looking at the cat's head with great curiosity. "'It's a friend of mine, a Cheshire cat,' said Alice. "'Allow me to introduce it.' "'I don't like the look of it at all. However, it may kiss my hand if it likes.' "'I'd rather not.' "'Oh, don't be impertinent, and don't look at me like that,' he 
He got behind Alice as he spoke. A cat may look at a king. A cat may look at a king, said Alice. I've read that in a sum book, but I don't remember where. Well, it must be removed, said the king very decidedly, and he called the queen, who was passing this moment. My dear, I would like you you to have this cat removed the queen had only one way of settling all the difficulties great or small off with his head said the she said without even looking round i'll touch the executioner myself said the king eagerly and he hurried off alice thought she might as well go back and see how the game was going on as she heard the queen's voice in the distance screaming with passion she had already heard her sentence three of the players to be executed for having missed their turns and she did not like the look of things at all as the game was in such confusion that she never knew whether it was her turn or not so she went in search of her hedgehog the hedgehog was engaged in a fight with another hedgehog which seemed to alice an excellent opportunity for croqueting one of them with the other the only difficulty was that her flamingo was gone across to the other side of the garden, where Alice could see it trying, in a helpless sort of way, to fly up into a tree. By the time she had caught the flamingo and brought it back, the fight was over, but both the hedgehogs were out of sight. But it doesn't matter much, thought Alice, as the arches are all gone from this side of the ground. So she tucked it away under her arm that it might not escape again, and went back for a little more conversation with her friend. When she got back to the Cheshire Cat, she was surprised to find a large crowd collected around it. There was a dispute going on between the executioner, the king, and the queen, who were all talking at once, while all the rest were quite silent and looked very uncomfortable. The moment Alice appears, she was appealed to by all three to settle the question, and they repeated their arguments to her, though, as they all spoke at once, she found it very hard indeed to make out exactly what was said. The executioner's argument was that you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it from, and that he never had to do such a thing before, and he wasn't going to begin at his time of life. Oh, hydration? Uh, yeah, let me refill my cup here, and we can do a hydration. Thank you for the proposal, Maruto. I appreciate it. Mm. Do... Oh, dear. Oh, I burned almost half a gallon of water just getting through the terms of service. I don't know, Twitch. I think there might be something in there that you don't need. Like, maybe the prohibition on simul's casting. But whatever. Hydration complete. Thank you, Naruto. Ugh. The king's argument was anything that had a head could be beheaded and that you weren't to talk nonsense. The Queen's argument was that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd have everybody executed all around. It was the last remark that it had made the whole party so grave and anxious. Why did I even read it? Because Twitch updated its terms of service earlier today. And as a result, I thought it prudent to read it out. Um, not only that, but then people can clip parts of it that they find particularly interesting. Also, maybe reading it in about a half dozen voices will make it a little less difficult to get through. However, <laughs> I would ask Kefri whether or not it worked. Kefri having been here from the very start of stream and quite aware of whether or not it was worth listening to. <laughs> uh... So, Hicks Robert remembers when they added the uniform section, then allowed topless body painting the next month, then swimming pool streams. I... Body painting is art. Alright. It should never have been a question whether or not it's allowed. It is allowed. What just happened there? Oh no. 
that happened. Uh, uh, Do I know what just happened? Nope, not a clue. But I'm back, so I'm calling it good. <laughs> All right. Alice could think of nothing else to say, but it belongs to the Duchess. You'd better ask her about it. She's in prison, the Queen said to the Executioner. Fetch her here! And the Executioner went off like an arrow. The cat's head began fading away the moment he was gone, and by the time he had come back with the Duchess, it had entirely disappeared. So the King and the Executioner ran wildly up and down looking for it, while the rest of the party went back to the game. I like this cat. It knows what it's doing. Oh, chapter nine, the mock turtles story. Hmm. How's everybody doing? Are we enjoying things so far? <laughs> well, I'm glad Naruto sees me as being as far away from a TOS violation as possible. <laughs> I don't know, though. This dress is pretty low cut. And my face is on full display. Whatever will people think? <laughs> All right. Get some stretchies in here. <sighs> All right. Chapter 9, The Mock Turtles Story. You can't think to how glad I am to see you again, you dear old thing, said the Duchess as she tucked her arm affectionately into Alice's, and they walked off together. Alice was very glad to find her in such a pleasant temper, and thought to herself that perhaps it was only the pepper in the kitchen that had made her so savage when they met. When I'm Duchess, she said to herself, not in a very hopeful tone, though, I won't have any pepper in my kitchen at all. Soup does very well without. Maybe it's always pepper that makes people hot-tempered. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, thank you, Caffrey. I'm glad to have the endorsement there. <laughs> she went on very much pleased at having found out a new kind of rule. And vinegar that makes them sour, and chamomile that makes them bitter, and, and barley sugar and such things that make children sweet-tempered. Oh, if only people knew that, then they wouldn't be so stingy about it, you know? She had quite forgotten the Duchess by this time, and was a little startled when she heard her voice close to her ear. You're thinking about something, my dear, and that makes you forget to talk. But I can't tell you just how now what the moral of that is, but I shall remember it in a bit. Oh, hello, Rage Demon! Thank you for the raid! It's lovely to see you! Of course, I saw you lurking earlier when we were still reading the Terms of Service, but I'm so glad you've dropped in. Hello. Uh, yes, we are still doing story time at this point. A oh, lucky rabbit. Thank you for dropping in. Very nice lurk. Rage, such a good little streamer. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, but we are currently just after the Queen's Croquet match in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I can't tell you just now the moral of that is, but I shall remember it in a bit. Perhaps it hasn't won? Alice ventured to remark. Tut tut, child, said the Duchess. Everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. And she squeezed herself up closer to Alice's side as she spoke. Alice did not much like keeping so close to her. First because the Duchess was very ugly, 
and second because she was exactly the right height to rest her chin upon Alice's shoulder, and it was an uncomfortably sharp chin. However, she did not like to be rude, so she bore it as well as she could. The game's going rather... The game's going rather better now, she said by way of keeping up the conversation a little. "'Tis so," said the Duchess, "'and the moral of that is, "'Oh, tis love, tis love that makes the world go round.'" Somebody said that it's done by everybody minding their own business. "'Oh, well, it means the same thing,' said the Duchess, digging her sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder as she added. "'And the moral of that is, uh, uh, "'take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves.'" How fond she is of finding morals and things, Alice thought to herself. I dare say you're wondering why I don't put my arm around your waist, the Duchess said after a pause. But the reason is I'm doubtful about that temper of your flamingo. Shall I try the experiment? He might bite, Alice cautiously replied, not feeling at all anxious to have the experiment tried. <laughs> oh, thank you for pointing out that I don't have the bot set up. Uh -huh. There we go. There's a proper shout out to Rage Demon. If you guys give uh, Rage a follow, quite a fun little chap. Uh, intends to stream mute, but is still very engaging. And of course, you can always step on a doormat. Or at least so Venny would say. Very true, said the Duchess. Flamingos and mustard both bite, and the moral of that is, uh, birds of a feather flock together. Only mustard isn't a bird. Right, as usual. Oh, what a clever way you have of putting things. It's a mineral, I think, said Alice. Well, of course it is, said the Duchess, who seemed ready to agree to everything that Alice had said. There's a large mustard mine near here, and the moral of that is, uh, the more there is of mine, the less there is of yours. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, I know, exclaimed Alice, who had not attended to this last remark. It's a vegetable. It doesn't look like one, but it is. I quite agree with you, said the Duchess. And the moral of that is, be what you would seem to be. Or if you'd like it put more simply, never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that you, what you were or you might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to be them otherwise. I don't think I quite got that right. Let me try that again. Be what you would seem to be, or if you'd like to put it more simply, never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that you what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. Do you need that run by you one more time, Hicks Rabbit? Be what you seem to be. Or, if you'd like it put more simply, <laughs> about to summon a demon without Latin. Oh, oh, is it time for a Latin interlude? <laughs> and rage with a password. Oh, wow. I, I didn't realize I was going to need my password counter for tonight. Where do we want the password count? Let's just leave it in the top corner here.
All right, so there we have it. <laughs> Rage making passwords, yep. It happens from time to time, folks. But that's just the nature of life. Every once in a while, you need a new password. So you look at somebody as close to directly in the eyes as you can manage and say, Oh, what a good boy. Or such a good girl. Or, in some cases, Oh my, what a lovely envy. I think I should understand that better, Alice said very politely, if I had it written down, but I can't quite follow it as you say it. Oh, it's nothing to what I could say if I chose, the Duchess replied in a pleased tone. Pray don't trouble yourself to say it any longer than that. Oh, don't talk about trouble. I make you a present of everything I've said as of yet. A cheap sort of present? I'm glad they don't give birthday presents like that. But she did not venture to say it out loud. Oh, tiny foxtrot. You're a very good listener. You're a good friend. And a good streamer. Didn't you know? But that's okay. Because I'm telling you now. I have a right... Thinking again? The Duchess asked, with another dig of her sharp little chin. I have a right to think said Alice sharply, for she was beginning to feel a little worried. Just about as much right as pigs have to fly, and the... But here, to Alice's great surprise, the Duchess's voice died away, even in the middle of her favorite word, moral, and the arm that was linked to hers began to tremble. All right, there's another password... It is story time, Caffrey. Don't worry about it. It's fine. <gasps> Alice looked up, and there stood the queen in front of them, with her arms folded, frowning like a thunderstorm. A fine day, your majesty, the duchess began in a low, weak voice. Now I give you fair warning, shouted the queen, stamping on the ground as she spoke. Either you or your head must be off, and that in about half no time. Think your choice. The Duchess took her choice and was gone in a moment. Let's go on with the game, the Queen said to Alice, but Alice was much too frightened <laughs> to say a word, but slowly followed her back to the croquet ground. The other guests had taken advantage of the Queen's absence, and were resting in the shade. However, the moment they saw her, they hurried back to the game, the queen merely remarking that the moment's delay would cost them their lives. All the time they were playing, the queen never left off quarreling with the other players and shouting, Off with his head! Or, Off with her head! Those whom she sentenced were taken into custody by the soldiers, who of course had to leave off being arches to do this, so that by the end of half an hour or so there were no arches left, and all the players except the Queen, the Queen, and Alice were in custody and under sentence of execution. The Queen left off, quite out of breath, and said to Alice, Have you seen the Mock Turtle yet? No, I don't even know what a Mock Turtle is. It's the thing Mock Turtle Soup is made from. I never heard of one or saw one. Come on, then, and he shall tell you the history. As they walked off together, Alice heard the king say in a low voice to the company generally, You are all pardoned. Come on. Come on, that's a good thing, she said to herself, for she had felt quite unhappy at the number of executions the queen had ordered. 
they very soon came upon a griffin lying fast asleep in the sun. If you don't know what a griffin is, look at the picture. Picture? There's no pictures here. There's no pictures. Oh no! What do I do, chat? There's no pictures. Hold on just a second. Let's find a picture of a griffin. No, wait, no, never mind. <laughs> We're fine. Up, oh, lazy thing, said the queen. And take this young lady to see the mock turtle and to hear his history. I must go back and see after some executions I have ordered. And she walked off, leaving Alice alone with the griffin. Alice did not quite like the look of the creature, but on the whole she thought it would be quite safe as to stay with, as to go after that savage queen. So she waited. The griffin sat up and rubbed its eyes, then it watched the queen till she was out of sight. Then it chuckled. <laughs> what fun, said the griffin, half to itself and half to Alice. Lucky Rabbit, thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. It's good to have you with us here. Oh, what is the fun? Why, she, said the griffin. It's all her face. It's all her fancy, that. And they never executes nobody, you know. Come on. Everybody says, come on here, thought Alice as she went slowly after it. I was never so ordered about in all my life. Never. They had not gone far before they saw the mock turtle in the distance, sitting sad and lonely on the little ledge of rock, and as they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing as if his heart would break. She pitied him deeply. Oh, what is the sorrow? she asked the griffin, and the griffin answered very nearly in the same words as before. It's all his fancy, that. He hasn't got no sorrow, you know. Come on. So they went up to the Mock Turtle, who looked at them with large eyes full of tears, but said nothing. This here young lady, said the Griffin, she wants for to know your history, she do. I'll tell it to her, said the Mock Turtle in a deep, hollow tone. Sit down, both of you, and don't speak a word till i finished. So they sat down, and nobody spoke for some minutes. Alice thought to herself, I don't see how he can ever finish if he doesn't begin. But she waited patiently. Once, said the Mock Turtle at last with a deep sigh, I was a real turtle. These words were followed by a very long silence broken only by an occasional exclamation of from the griffin and the constant heavy sobbing of the mock turtle. Alice was very nearly getting up, saying, Thank you, sir, for your interesting story, but she could not help thinking there must be more to come, so she sat still and said nothing. So, do I count this as a password from Lewis Carroll sent across the ages in order to reach us through a book? I like the idea. But I don't think I want to add it to my password count for tonight. After all, that one was made so long ago. When we were little... The Mock Turtle went on at last, more calmly, though still sobbing a little now and then. We went to school in the sea... The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Well, why did you call him Tortoise if he wasn't one? We call him Tortoise because he taught us, said the Mock Turtle angrily. Really, you are very tall. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong voice. <clears throat> you ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking such a simple question, added the Gryphon. And then they both sat silent and looked at poor Alice, who felt ready to sink into the earth. At last, the griffin said to the mock turtle, Drive on, old fellow, don't be all day about it. And went on, and he went on in these words. Yes, we went to school in the sea, though you mayn't believe it. And never said I didn't. You did. Hold your tongue, added the griffin before Alice could speak again. 
the mock turtle went on. We had the best of educations. In fact, we went to school every day. I've been to every school day. Every... I've been to a day school too, said Alice. You needn't be so proud as all that. With extras? Yes. We learned French and music. And washing? Certainly not. Ah, then yours wasn't really a good school, said the Mock Turtle in a tone of great relief. Now at ours they had at the end of the bill French music and washing extra. You couldn't have wanted it much, living at the bottom of the sea. I couldn't afford to learn it. I took only the regular course. Oh, what was that? Reeling and writhing move, of course, to begin with, the Mock Turtle replied. And then the different branches of arithmetic, ambition, distraction, uglification, and duration. Oh heck, I love that far too much. This this is this is this is quality right here. <laughs> I never heard of uglification, Alice ventured to say. What is it? The Grifton lifted up its paws in surprise. What? Never heard of uglifying? You know what it is to beautify, I suppose. Yes, it means to make anything prettier well then if you don't know what to uglify is you are a, a simpleton Alice did not feel encouraged to ask any more questions about it so she turned to the mock turtle and said what else you, you what else have you to learn well there was mystery the mock turtle replied counting off subjects on his flappers Mystery, ancient and modern, with geography, then drawing. The drawing master was an old conger eel that used to come once a week. He taught us drawing, stretching, and fainting in coils. What was that like? Well, I can't show it to you myself. I'm too stiff, and the griffin never learnt it. Hadn't time. I went to the classics master, though. He was an old crab, he was. I never went to him. He taught laughing and grief, they used to say. Classical laughing and classical grief. <laughs> oh, good grief. So he did, so he did, said the griffin, sighing in his turns, and both creatures hid their faces in their paws. And how many hours a day did you do lessons? said Alice in a hurry to change the subject. Ten hours the first day, nine the next, and so on. Oh, what a curious plan. That's the reason they're called lessons. Because... Oh, this is the griffin, sorry. And that's the reason they're called lessons. Because they lessen from day to day. This was quite a new idea to Alice, and she thought it over a little before she made her next remark. Then the eleventh day must have been a holiday? Of course it was. And how did you manage on the twelfth? Alice went on eagerly. That's enough about lessons. The griffin. That's enough about lessons. Tell her something about the games now. I'm not turning psycho rage. I just enjoy a good pun. And those are some delightful plays on words. Mm. 
Okay. Chapter 10. I... I... all. Caffrey? Why would you say something like that? Oh dear. Oh dear. Why would you say that? So mean. So mean. Also, how did I get the nickname Celery? <sighs> oh my. Rage, and here I went to vouch for you, and you're over there calling me a psycho in front of everyone. I expected better from you. <laughs> We're all a little crazy. This is very true, Naruto. <laughs> oh, I can thank Luli for the nickname Celery. Well, then I'll have to treasure it. After all, Luli is a treasure. You know, I haven't given a shout out to Luli recently. Luli is the one who made this lovely overlay. So... Let's all make sure that if you haven't already, follow Luli. They're awesome. The lobster quadrille. The mock turtle sighed deeply and drew the back one of his flapper across his eyes. He looked at Alice and tried to speak. Hmm. The line from a genius and a madman is thin. How am I mad? Hmm. Well, there's an interesting question, Naruto. Am I mad? I don't think I'm particularly angry. I'm enjoying reading the story to everyone and hope that you're all enjoying having it read in return. So, I'll pose that to the audience. Am I mad? Or am I delighted to be here? Happy to have such lovely people here along with me and enjoying a chance to share a story that I think is worth retelling that has little bits of reference and humor. Kefri thinks a mad scientist doesn't know that they're mad. I would posit that a mad scientist can be fully aware of their madness and still more than a little bit involved in its production and existence. Or at the very least, the madness is something to build off. Hello, Elise. Thank you for dropping in. It's good to see you, cutie. <laughs> I'm glad to hear my reading voice is calming for you, tiny foxtrot, and that I get a chance to stay with you in bed tonight. The mock turtle sighed deeply and drew the back of one flipper across his eyes. He looked at Alice and tried to speak, but for a minute or two, sobs choked his voice. Same. Same as if he had a bone in his throat, said the griffin, and it set to work shaking him and punching him in the back. At last, the mock turtle recovered his voice, and with tears running down his cheeks, he went on again. <laughs> you may not have lived much under the sea. I haven't. And perhaps you were never even introduced to a lobster. Alice began to say, I once tasted, but checked herself hastily and said, No, never. So you can have no idea what a delightful thing a lobster quadrille is. No, indeed. What sort of dance is it? Why, you first form into a line along the seashore. Oh, doggone it, I keep missing that it's the griffin speaking. Why, you first form into a line along the seashore. Two lines, cried the mock turtle. Seals, turtles, salmon, and so on. Then, when you've cleared all the jellyfish out of the way... That generally takes some time. You advance twice. Each with the lobster as a partner. Of course, the mock turtle said. Advance twice, set to partners. Change lobsters and retire in the same order. Then, you know, you throw the... The lobsters! Shouted the griffin with a bound into the air. As far out to sea as you can. Swim after them! Screamed the griffin. Turn a somersault in the sea! Cried the mock turtle, capering wildly about. 
Change lobsters again! Pret yelled the griffin at the top of its voice. Back to land again, and that's all the first figure, said the mock turtle, suddenly dropping his voice as the two creatures, who had been jumping about like mad things all the time, sat down again very sadly and quietly and looked at Alice. It must be a very pretty dance, said Alice timidly. Would you like to see a little of it? asked the mock turtle. Very much indeed, said Alice. Come, let's try the first figure, said the mock turtle to the griffin. We can do without the lobsters, you know. What shall we sing? Oh, you sing. I've forgotten the words. So they began solemnly dancing round and round Alice, every now and then treading on her toes while they passed too close and waving their forepaws to mark the time, while the mock turtle sang this very slowly and sadly. Will you walk a little faster, said a whiting to a snail. There's a porpoise close behind us and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you? Won't you join the dance? You can really have no notion how delightful it will be when they take us up and throw us with the lobsters out to sea. But the snail replied too far, too far, and gave a look askance, said he thanked the whiting kindly, but he would not join the dance. Would not, could not, would not, could not, would not join the dance. Would not, could not, would not, could not, could not join the dance. What matters it how far we go, his scaly friend replied. There is another shore, you know, upon the other side, the further off from England, nearer is to France. Then turn not pale, beloved snail, but come and join the dance. Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, won't you join the dance? Thank you. It's a very interesting dance to watch, said Alice, feeling very glad that it was over at last. And I do so like that curious song about the whiting. Oh, as to the whiting, said the mock turtle. They, you've seen them, of course. Yes, I've often seen them at Din... She checked herself hastily. I don't know where Din may be, said the Bok Turtle. But if you've seen them so often, of course you know what they're like. I believe so. They have their tails in their mouths and they're all over crumbs. Well, you're wrong about the crumbs, said the Mock Turtle. Crumbs would all wash off in the sea. But they have their tails in their mouths and the reason is... Here, the Mock Turtle yawned and shut his eyes. Tell her about the reason and all that, he said to the Gryphon. The reason is, said the Gryphon, that they would go with the lobsters to the dance. So they got thrown out to sea, so they had to fall a long way. So they got their tails fast in their mouths so they couldn't get them out again. That's all. Thank you, said Alice. It's very interesting. I never knew so much about a whiting before. I can tell you more than that if you like. Do you know why it's called a whiting? I never thought about it. But why? It does the boots and shoes, the griffin replied very solemnly. Alice was thoroughly puzzled. 
does the boots and shoes... She, spe she repeated in a wondering tone. Why, what are your shoes done with? Said the griffin. I mean, what makes them so shiny? Alice looked down at them and considered a little before she gave her answer. They're sun with blacking, I believe. Boots and shoes under the sea are done with a whiting. Now you know. And what are they made of? Alice asked in a tone of great curiosity. Soles and eels, of course, the griffin replied rather impatiently. Any shrimp could have told you that. If I'd been the whiting, said Alice, whose thoughts were still running on the song, I'd have said to the porpoise, keep back, please. We don't want you with us. They were obliged to have them with them. They were obliged to have him with them, the mock turtle said. No wise fish would go anywhere without a porpoise. Wouldn't it really? said Alice in a tone of great surprise. Of course not, said the mock turtle. Why, if a fish came to me and told me he was going a journey, I should say with what porpoise? Don't you mean purpose? I mean what I say, the mock turtle replied in an offended tone, and the griffin added, Come, let's hear some of your adventures. I could tell you my adventures, beginning from this morning, said Alice a little timidly, but it's no use going back to yesterday because I was a different person then. Explain all that. No, no, the adventures first said the griffin in an impatient tone. Explanations take such a dreadful time. So Alice began telling her adventures from the time she saw the white rabbit. She was a little nervous about it at just at first. The two creatures got so close to her, one on each side, and opened their eyes and mouths so very wide, but she gained courage as she went on. Her listeners were perfectly quiet till she got to the part about her repeating, You are old, Father William, to the caterpillar and the words all coming out different, and then the Mock Turtle drew a long breath and said, That's very curious. It's about as curious as could be, said the Gryphon. It all came different, said the Mock Turtle repeated thoughtfully. I should like to hear her try and repeat something now. Tell her to begin. He looked at the griffin as if he thought it had some kind of authority over Alice. Stand up and repeat, "'Tis the voice of the sluggard," said the griffin. How the creatures order one about and make one repeat lessons, thought Alice. I might as well be at school at once. However, she got up and began to repeat it, but her head was so full of the lobster quadrille she barely knew what she was saying, and the words came out very clear indeed. "'Tis the voice of the lobster I hear him declare. "'You have baked me too brown. I must sugar my hair. "'As a duck with its eyelids, so he with his nose "'trims his belt and his buttons and turns out his toes.'" Later editions continued as follows. "'When the sands are all dry, he is gay as a lark "'and will talk in contemptuous tones of the shark. "'But when t the tide rises and sharks are around, "'his voice has a timid and tremulous sound.'" Well, that's different from what I used to say when I was a child. Well, I never heard it before, but it sounds uncommon nonsense. I mean, this whole book is uncommon nonsense. That's part of the delight. Mm. Okay. Hydration complete. Wait, nobody redeemed it. Duck on it. Alice said nothing. She had sat down with her face in her hands, wondering if anything would ever happen in a natural way again. I should like to have it explained, said the Mock Turtle. She can't explain it, said the Gryphon hastily. Go on with the next verse. What about his toes? How could he turn them out with his nose, you know? 
It's the first position in dancing, Alice said, but was dreadfully puzzled by the whole thing and longed to change the subject. Go, Go on with the next verse, the griffin repeated impatiently. It begins, I passed by his garden. Alice did not dare to disobey, though she felt sure it would all come wrong, and she went on in a trembling voice. I passed by his garden, marked with one eye, how the owl and the panther were sharing a pie. Later editions continued as follows. The panther took pie crust and gravy and meat, while the owl had the dish as its share of the treat. When the pie was all finished, the owl, as a boon, was kindly permitted to pocket the spoon, while the panther received the knife and fork with a growl and concluded the banquet. Oh. What is the use of repeating all that stuff if you don't explain it as you go on? It's by far the most confusing thing I ever heard. Yes, I think you better leave off, said the griffin, and Alice was only too glad to do so. Shall we try another figure of the lobster quadrille? The griffin went on. Or would you like the mock turtle to sing you a song? Oh, a song, please, if the mock turtle would be so kind, Alice repeated so eagerly that the griffin said in a rather offended tone, Hmm, no accounting for taste. Sing her turtle soup, will you, old fellow? The mock turtle sighed deeply and began in a sometimes choked vo voice, sometimes choked with sobs, to sing this. Beautiful soup, so rich and green, waiting in a hot tureen. Who for such dainties would not stoop? Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Soup of the evening, beautiful soup, beautiful soup, beautiful soup, soup of the evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. Beautiful soup, who cares for fish, game, or any other dish? Who would not give all else for toop? Any worth only of beautiful soup? Any worth only of beautiful soup? Beautiful soup, beautiful soup, soup of the evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. Chorus again cried the griffin, and the mock turtle had just begun to repeat it when a cry of THE TRIAL IS BEGINNING it was heard in the distance. Come on, cried the griffin, and taking Alice by the hand, it hurried off without waiting for the end of the song. What trial is it? Alice panted as she ran, but the griffin only answered, Come on, and ran faster while more and more faintly came carried on the breeze that followed them, the melancholy words. Soup of the evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. Hmm. <sighs> <sighs> Well, that was an experience. Um, I think my singing must have scared at least a few people off, though. Oh, dear. Well, all the same. Ugh. Well, thank you, Tiny. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Oh, 
Oh, so we're about to get the, to the trial of the tarts. This could be a fun one. But I think I need to relax my narrator voice for just a little bit here. So I am actually going to switch over to a song. Um, I suppose this might as well be something that I do now. Um, I have a couple of different song parodies that I've been working on over the last while here. And, uh, one of them is, uh, well, we'll see how well it comes out. I think, uh, folks are familiar with the tune under it for the most part, but, uh, <laughs> Take a break, drink water, you got it. Uh, that is definitely on my list here. Ugh. Oh, wow. My gallon jug has nearly been exhausted, though. Whew. All right. <clears throat> yeah. I'm a great streamer, my chat says I'm an awesome one, and of my content I am justly proud. Beautiful streamer, my content's so much purer than the sponsored anime VTuber crowd. So tell me, my Twitch chat, why my channel flounders here on the dregs of Twitch affiliate. I stream here most days now, with adverts running all the time, the interruptions out of all control. I'm tired, so tired, I've forsaken my kin. This burning desire drives me to stream again. Whew. It's not my fault that it's a pain to do the networking and always spread my name. It's not my fault that I got banned because I made a stupid gesture with my hand. So help me on Twitter. Don't let my channel end like this. To all the world, please let my words be shown. I deserve that top slot for all the dozen viewers here now, and let them all be mine and mine alone. Hey, guess what, streamer? I've just made partner. What? But how? Never mind. I'll get there anyway. My ire grows higher. The viewers I won't spurn. Choose me and my fire. This is a roll I've I'll make better content. I'll improve my Discord too. And you will watch mine when it's my turn. Thank you all for putting up with me on that. I, I appreciate your patience. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do fear that I may have woken somebody else up with that. But all the same. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> there's that. No, actually that uh, gave me a chance to stretch out. So I'm kind of appreciating it. 
Caffrey, if you liked it, you're more than welcome to clip it. I always appreciate everybody in chat here, and thank you for the encouragement. I'm glad it was actually good. <laughs> oh, Alright, uh, one more drink, and then we'll get into who stole the tarts. Mm. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear it. <clears throat> Chapter 11 Who Stole the Tarts? The King and Queen of Hearts were seated on their throne when they arrived, with a great crowd assembled around them. All sorts of little birds and beasts, as well as the whole pack of cards. The knave was standing before them in chains, with a soldier on each side to guard him. Uh, oh, excuse me. And near the king was a white rabbit, with a trumpet in one hand, and a scroll of parchment in the other. In the very middle of the court was a table, with a large dish of tarts upon it. They looked so good that it made Alice quite hungry to look at them. Oh, if only they'd get the trial done, and hand round the refreshments. But there seemed to be no chance of this, so she began looking at everything about her to pass away the time. Alice had never been in a court of justice before, but she had read about them in books, and she was quite pleased to find that she knew the name of nearly everything there. Mm, that's the judge, she said to herself, because of his great wig. <laughs> I'm glad to see you, Elise. You know, since you're here... Those who aren't already familiar with her, Elise Vermillion is a lovely young lady who has a strong attitude. Um, her streams are 18 plus, and they are deservedly so, but she's quite a bit of fun to be around. She's very engaging, and I've found very few people... How dare I what? How dare I remind people that you're here? That you've brought with you your lovely smile and your particular brand of charm? Should I not be proud of you? Because I absolutely am. At any rate, if you have a chance, I do encourage you to join us in following Elise Vermillion, a lovely streamer who plays a variety of games and has the attitude to really shake up one's life and spice it up just a little bit. The judge, by the way, was the king, and as he wore his crown over the wig, look at the front of this piece if you want to see how he did it. He did not look at all comfortable, and it was certainly not becoming. And that's the jury box, thought Alice. And those twelve creatures, she was obliged to see creatures, you see, because some of them were animals and some were birds. I suppose they are the jurors. She said the last two or three times over to herself, being rather proud of it, for she thought, and rightly too, that very few little girls of her age knew the meaning of it all. However, jury men would have done just as well. The twelve jurors were all writing very busily on slates. What are they doing? Alice whispered to the griffin. They can't have anything to put down yet before the trial's begun. They're putting down their names, the griffin whispered in reply for they fear they should forget them before the end of the trial. <laughs> Stupid things. Alice began in a loud, indignant voice, but she stopped hastily, for the white rabbit cried out, Silence in the court! And the king put on his spectacles and looked anxiously around to make out who was talking. Alice could see, as well as if she were looking over their shoulders, that all the jurors were writing down Stupid things! on their slates, and she could even make out that one of them that didn't know how to spell stupid, and that he had to ask his neighbor to tell him. A nice muddle their slates will be before the trial's over, thought Alice. One of the jurors had a pencil that squeaked. This, of course, Alice could not stand, and she went round the court and got behind him and very soon found an opportunity of taking it away. She did, so she did it so quickly that the poor little juror, it was Bill, the lizard, could not make out at all what had become of it. So after hunting all about for it, he was obliged to write with one finger for the rest of the day. And this was of very little use, as it left no mark on the slate. Harold, read the accusation, 
said the king. On this, the little white rabbit blew three blasts on the trumpet, and then unrolled the parchment scroll and read as followed. The Queen of Hearts, she made some tarts all on a summer day. The Knave of Hearts, he stole those tarts and took them quite away. Consider your verdict, the king said to the jury. Not yet, not yet, the rabbit hastily interrupted. There's a great deal to come before that. Call the first witness, said the king, and the white rabbit blew three blasts of the trumpet and called out, First witness! The first witness was the hatter. He came in with a teacup in one hand and a little piece of bread and butter in the other. I beg your pardon, your majesty, for bringing these in, but I hadn't quite finished my tea when I was sent for. You ought to have finished. When did you begin? The Hatter looked at the March Hare, who had followed him into the court, arm in arm with the Dormouse. Fourteenth uh, of March, I think it was. Fifteenth, said the March Hare. Sixteenth, added the Dormouse. Write that down, the King said to the jury, and the jury eagerly wrote down all three dates on their slates, then added them up and reduced the answer to shillings and pence. Take off your hat, the king said to the hatter. It is mine, said the hatter. Stolen, said the king, turning to the jury, who instantly made a memorandum of the fact. I keep them to sell, the hatter added as an explanation. I've none of my own, I'm a hatter. Here the queen put on her spectacles and began staring at the hatter, who turned pale and fidgeted. Give your evidence, said the king. And don't be nervous, or I'll have you executed on the spot. This did not seem to encourage the witness at all. He kept shifting from one foot to the other, looking uneasily at the queen, and in his confusion he bit a large piece of his teacup instead of the bread and butter. Just at this moment Alice felt a very curious sensation, which puzzled her a good deal until she made out what it was. She was beginning to grow larger again, and she... Th thought at first she would get up and leave the court, but on second thought she decided to remain where she was as long as the room for her, there was room for her. If only you wouldn't squeeze so, said the Dormouse, who was sitting next to her. I can hardly breathe. I can't help it. I'm growing. You've no right to grow here. Don't talk nonsense. You know you're growing, too. Yes, but I grow at a reasonable pace. Not in that ridiculous fashion. And he got very sulky, up very sulkily, and crossed over to the other side of the court. All this time, the queen had never let off staring at the hatter, and just as the dormouse crossed the court, she said to one of the officers of the court, Bring me the list of the singers and the last concert. On which the wretched hatter trembled so that he shook both his shoes off. Give your evidence, or I'll have you executed whether you're nervous or not. I'm a poor man, your majesty, and I hadn't begun my tea, not above a week or so, and what with the bread and butter getting so thin, and the twinkling of the tea. The twinkling of the what? Began with the tea. Of course the tinkling begins with a T. Do, what do you take me for, a dunce? Go on! <laughs> Naruto popping off over there. I'm a poor man, and most of the things tinkled after that. Only the March Hare said, I didn't! The March Hare interrupted in a great hurry. You did! I deny it! He denies it. Leave out that part. Well, at any rate, the... Well, at any rate, the Dormouse said... The Hatter went on, looking anxiously round to see if he would deny it too, but the Dormouse denied nothing, being fast asleep. After that, continued the Hatter, I cut some more bread and butter. But what did the Dormouse say? One of the jury asked. Is that I can't remember. You must remember, or I'll have you executed. The miserable Hatter dropped his teacup and bread and butter and went down on one knee. I'm a poor man, your majesty. You're a very poor speaker. Here, one of the guinea pigs cheered and was immediately suppressed by the officers of the court. 
as that is a rather a hard word, I will just explain to you how it was done. They had a large canvas bag which tied up at the mouth with strings. They slipped the guinea pig head first in and sat upon it. Well, that's certainly one way. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I could go with this. I'm glad I've seen that done, thought Alice. I've so often read in newspapers at the end of trials, there were some attempts at applause, which was immediately suppressed by the officers of the court. I never understood what it meant till now. That's all you know about it. You may stand down, continued the king. I can't go no lower. I'm on the floor as it is. Then you may sit down. Here the other guinea pig cheered and was suppressed. Um, that finished the guinea pigs, thought Alice. Now we shall get on better. I'd rather finish my tea, said the Hatter with an anxious look at the Queen, who was reading the list of singers. You may go, said the King to the Hatter, who hurriedly left the court without even waiting to put his shoes on. And, and just take his head off outside, the Queen said to one of her officers, but the Hatter was out of sight before the officer could get to the door. Call the next witness, said the king. The next witness was the duchess's cook. She carried the pepper box in her hand, and Alice guessed who it was even before she got into the court, by the way the people near the door began sneezing all at once. Give your evidence. Shan't. The king looked anxiously at the white rabbit, who said in a low voice, Your majesty must cross-examine this witness. Well, if I must, I must, the king said with a melancholy air, and after folding his arms and frowning at the cook till his eyes were nearly out of sight, he said in a deep voice, What are tarts made of? Pepper, mostly. Treacle, said a sleepy voice behind her. Call, it, call that dormouse! Behead that dormouse! Turn that dormouse out of court! Suppress him! Pinch him off with his whiskers! cried the queen. For some minutes, the whole court was in confusion, getting the dormouse turned out, and by the time they had settled down again, the cook had disappeared. Never mind, said the king with an air of great relief. Call the next witness. And he added in an undertone to the queen, Really, my dear, you must cross-examine the next witness. It's quite makes my forehead ache. Alice watched while the white rabbit, as he fumbled over the list, feeling very curious to see what the next witness would be like. But they haven't got much evidence yet, she said to herself. Imagine her surprise when the white rabbit read out at the top of his shrill little voice the name Alice! And the final chapter, chapter 12, Alice's Evidence. Hmm. <clears throat> All right. And it's just as well that we're getting near the very end of things here. Um, but with that said, I'm going to take just another very quick break here. Um, my water is just about out and I'm going to need some more here. So as I've done before, I'll be right back.
Naruto, what's this about? Be prepared. I know that your powers of retention are as wet as a warthog's backside, but thick as you are, pay attention! My words are a matter of pride. It's clear from your vacant expression. The lights are not all on upstairs. But we're talking kings in succession. Even you can't be caught unawares. So prepare for the chance of a lifetime. Be prepared for sensational news. A shiny new era is tiptoeing nearer. And where do we feature? Just listen to teacher. I know it sounds sordid, but you'll be rewarded when at last I am given my dues. And in justice, deliciously square. Be prepared. I'm not going to sing the rest of that because I don't want, you know, a certain mouse to come after me. I much prefer my kidneys attached where they are. But. You know, if somebody's going to throw a song into chat and I happen to know it, why the heck not? So, with that, let's see what we can do here. All right. As I said earlier, I believe this is actually the last chapter. Mm hmm. It is, in fact. So, did I memorize the Disney songs? I watched the VHS a lot. You are not wrong. I spent a rather excessive amount of time uh, watching the Lion King VHS. Uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame I didn't get to see too many times. Uh, I think it was only three or four as a kid. Uh, but I did end up watching it many years later and found that the music held up. Like so hard uh yeah we are at the last chapter of this um so with that said uh let's begin here cried alice quite forgetting in the flurry of the moment how large she had grown in the last few minutes and she jumped up in such a hurry that she tripped over the jury box with the edge of her skirt upsetting all the jurymen onto their heads of the crowd below, and there lay sprawling about, reminding her very much of a globe of goldfish she had accidentally upset the week before. Alice in Wonderland's cartoon stays accurate to the story? Well, that's good to hear. Oh, I beg your pardon, she exclaimed in a tone of great dismay, and began picking them up again as quickly as she could, for the accident of the goldfish kept running in her head, and she had a vague idea of that they must be collected at once and put back into the jury box or they would die. The trial cannot proceed until all the jurymen are back in their proper places. All, he repeated with great emphasis, looking hard at Alice as he said so. Alice looked at the jury box and saw that in her haste she had put the lizard in head downward, and the poor little thing was waving its tail about in a melancholy way, being quite unable to move. She soon got it out again and put it right. Not that it signifies much, she said to herself. I should think it would be quite as much use in the trial one way up as the other. As soon as the jury had recovered from the shock of being upset and their slates and pencils had been found and handed back to them, they set to work very diligently to write out a history of the accident, all except the lizard, who seemed too much overcome to do anything but sit with its mouth open, gazing up into the roof of the court. Withering to dust because you mentioned VHS? Naruto? My goodness. I didn't realize you had such trouble with them. Video cassettes were a fine way to record things. As soon as the jury had recovered a little from the shock of being upset in their slates... Oh, yes. Okay. Easing up the roof of the court. 
What do you know about this business? The king said to Alice. Nothing. Nothing whatever? Nothing whatever. That's very important. The king said, turning to the jury. They were just beginning to write this down on their slates when the white rabbit interrupted. Unimportant, your majesty. Means, uh, of course. He said in a very respectful tone, but frowning and making faces at him as he spoke. Caffrey, thank you for backing me up. It's always good to know that I've got you on my side. You're a wonderful friend, and I'm really grateful. Important, unimportant, unimportant, important. As if he were trying to... Which word sounded best? Unimportant, of course I meant... Uh, he said hastily. Some of the jury wrote it down important, and some unimportant. Alice could see this as she was near enough to look over at their slates. But it doesn't matter a bit, she thought to herself. Ah, rage demon turning to dust. Poor little thing. I guess we'll have to sweep rage up and keep them in a nice safe cage until they can pull themselves back together. At this moment, the king, who had been for some time busily writing in his notebook, cacked out, Silence! and read out from his book, Rule 42, all persons more than a mile high to leave the court. Everybody looked at Alice. I'm not a mile high. You are. Nearly two miles high. Well, I shan't go at any rate, said Alice. Besides, that's not a regular rule. You invented it just now. One more password for my collection. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear you enjoy being on my side when it suits the chaos suitedly. It's the oldest rule in the book, said the king. And then it ought to be rule number one, said Alice. The king turned pale and shut his notebook hastily. Consider your verdict, he said to the jury in a low, trembling voice. There's more evidence to come yet, please, your majesty, said the white rabbit, jumping up in great hurry. This paper has just been picked up. What's in it? I haven't opened it yet, but it seems to be a letter written by to the prisoner by or by the prisoner to to somebody. It must have been that, said the king, unless it was written to nobody, which isn't unusual, you know. Just who is it? Just who is it directed to? said one of the jurymen. Anti hero, you get paid in money, not kindness. Hmm. I'm sorry to hear that, Naruto. I would have figured you were a bit more generous, but I understand. If you're not looking for kindness, I suppose I don't have to give you any. Which is a shame, because I normally think of you as such a good boy. It isn't a- It isn't directed at all, said the White Rabbit. In fact, there's nothing written on the outside. He unfolded the paper as he spoke and added, It isn't a letter at all. It's a set of verses. Are they in the prisoner's handwriting? Asked another of the jurymen. No, they're not. And that's the queerest thing about it. The jury all looked puzzled. He must have imitated somebody else's hand. The jury all brightened up again. Please, your majesty. I didn't write it, and I can't prove I did. There's no name signed at the end. If you didn't sign it, that only makes the matter worse. You must have meant some mischief, or else you'd have signed your name like an honest man. There was a general clapping of hands at this, and the first really clever thing that King had said all that day. That's all right, Naruto. You don't have to answer. That proves his guilt. It proves nothing of the sort, said Alice. Why, you don't even know what they're about. Read them, the king said. 
White Rabbit put on his spectacles. Where shall I begin, Your Majesty? Begin at the beginning, and go on till you come to the end, then stop. These were the verses the White Rabbit read. They told me you had been to her and mentioned me to him. She gave me a good character, but said I could not swim. He sent them word, and I had not gone. We know it to be true. If she should punish the matter on, what would become of you? I gave her one, they gave him two. You gave us three or more. They all returned from him to you, though they were mine before. Or if I or she should chance to be involved in this affair, he trusts to you it would to set them free exactly as they were. My notion was that you had been, before she had this fit, an obstacle that came between him and ourselves and it. Don't let him know she liked them best, for this must ever be, a secret kept from all the rest between yourself and me. <laughs> Quite the cute set of emotes there, Naruto. Thank you for sending him along. That's the most important piece of evidence we've heard yet, said the king, rubbing his hands. So now let the jury, if any one of them can explain it, said Alice, and she had grown so large in the last few minutes that she wasn't a bit afraid of interrupting him. I'll give him a sixpence. I don't believe there's an atom of meaning to it. The jury all wrote down on their slates. She doesn't believe there's an atom of meaning to in it, but none of them attempted to explain the paper. There's no meaning in it that it saves us a world of trouble, you know, as we needn't try to find any. And yet, I don't know. He went on, spreading out the verses on his knee and looking at them with one eye. I seem to see some meaning in them after all. Said I could not swim. You can't swim, can you? He added to the knave. The knave shook his head sadly. Do I look like it? He said, which he certainly did not, being entirely made of cardboard. All right so far. The king went on, mumbling over the verses to himself. We know it to be true. I gave... that That's the jury, of course. I gave her one. They gave him two. Why, that must be what he did with the darts, you know. Uh, but it goes on to say they all return from him to you. Why, there they are, said the king triumphantly, pointing to the tarts on the table. Nothing can be clearer than that. Then again, uh, before she had this fit. You've never had fits, my dear, I think, he said to the queen. Never, said the queen frivolously, throwing an inkstand at the lizard as she spoke. The unfortunate little Bill had left off writing on his slate with one finger, as he found it made no mark, but now hastily began again using the ink that was trickling down his face, as long as it lasted. Then the words don't fit you, said the king, looking round the court with a smile. There was a dead silence. It's a pun, said the king in an offended tone, and everybody laughed. Let the jury consider the verdict, the king said for about the twentieth time that day. No, no, sentence first, verdict afterwards. Stuff and nonsense, the idea of having a sentence first. Hold your tongue, I won't. Off with her head, the queen shouted at the top of her voice. Nobody moved. Who cares for you, said Alice. She had grown to her full size by this time. You're nothing but a pack of playing cards. At this, the whole pack rose up into the air and came flying down upon her. She gave a little scream, half of fright, half of anger, and tried to beat them off, and found herself lying on the back bank with her head in the lap of her sister, who was gently brushing away some dead leaves that had fluttered down from the trees upon her face. Wake up, Alice, dear, she said to, said her sister. Oh, why, what a long sleep you've had. Oh, I've had such a curious dream, said Alice, and she told her sister as well as she could remember them. All of these strange adventures of hers that you have just been reading about. And when she had finished, her sister kissed her and said, It was a curious dream, my dear, certainly. But now go run into your tea, it's getting late. So Alice got up and ran off, thinking while she ran, as well as she might, what a wonderful dream it had been. But her sister sat still, just as she left her, leaning her head on her hand and watching the setting sun and thinking of little Alice and her wonderful adventures, till she too began dreaming after a fashion. And this was her dream. First, she dreamed of little Alice herself, and once again the tiny hands were clasped on her knee, 
and the bright, eager eyes were looking up into hers. She could hear the very tones of her voice and see that queer little toss of her head to keep the, back the wandering hair that would always get into her eyes. And still as she listened, or seemed to listen, the whole place around her became alive with the strange creatures of her little sister's dream. The long grass rustled at her feet. The white rabbit hurried by. The frightened mouse splashed in his way through the neighboring pool. She could hear the rattle of the teacups as the March Hare and his friends shared their never-ending meal, and the shrill voice of the queen ordering off her unfortunate guest to execution. Once more, the pig baby was sneezing on the duchess's knee while plates and dishes crashed around it. Once more, the shriek of the griffin, the squeaking of the lizard's slate pencil, and the choking of the suppressed guinea pigs filled the air mixed up with the distant sobs of the miserable mock turtle. So she sat on, with closed eyes, and half believed herself in Wonderland, though she knew she had but to open them again and all would change to dull reality. The grass would be only rustling in the wind, the pool rippling to the waving of the reeds, the rattling of teacups would change to tinkling of ship sheep bells, and the queen's shrill cries to the voice of the shepherd boy, and the sneeze of the baby, the shriek of the griffin, and all the other queer noises would change, she knew, from the confused clamor of the busy farmyard, while the lowing of the cattle in the distance would take the place of the mock turtle's heavy sobs. Lastly, she pictured herself how this same little sister of hers would, after, in the aftertime, be herself a grown woman, and how she would keep through all her riper years, the simple and loving heart of her childhood, how she would gather about her other little children and make their eyes bright and eager with many strange tales, perhaps even with the dream of Wonderland of long ago, and how she would feel with all their simple joys and find a pleasure in all their simple joys, remembering her own child life and the happy summer days. The end. Um, then the Project Gutenberg. Let's see here. Oh, of course they put the terms at the very end. Finally? Well, okay then, Naruto. Wow. Uh, and we finished pretty much right at midnight here. So, that would be Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Thank you all for joining me on this trip. It's been a heck of a long one, but I hope you've all gotten some enjoyment out of it. Um, if you've been here since the very beginning, I'm delighted that you've sat down and listened to this for, you know, seems to be what five hours give or take five six somewhere in there <laughs> you tabbed out and missed the end oh no Caffrey you'll have to see the VOD when it comes out then <laughs> or something it's fine don't worry about it oh dear uh Oh, and what happened with that? All right, Naruto, thank you so much for sticking around. I'm sorry if we've made you entirely too late for something. And I'm glad you got to find it comfy, Lucky Rabbit. Uh, we ended up with three passwords so far for this stream. Um, and you know, it's getting late enough that I should probably take off on my own. I do have work in a few hours and need to be prepared for it, so I will probably have to... You're not doing anything else except sleeping. Naruto, your sleep is important. Remember, we do want to keep you happy, safe, and healthy. And that goes for everybody in the chat. As delighted as I am to have you with me, I want to make sure everyone here, these precious people who have come and spent their time with me, are getting their needs met. Uh, don't, don't worry about me. I, I sleep when I sleep, and that that's totally fine. It's going to be okay. 
but I really do appreciate you joining in with me. Thank you for spending time here. And with that, let's see who we want to raid. Does anybody have a particular raid candidate for tonight? Oh, Hicks Rabbit, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. It's good to have you with us here. Um, but yes, if anybody has a uh if anybody has a preference here in terms of that uh you know do we want to raid out to one person or another uh celine needs sleep 101 no no i cannot i don't know why you would think i would be able to do that but mergle All right. Blythe VT. Uh, let me take a quick peek at them. Um, so bearing in mind that this is not an 18 plus stream here, uh, I don't know how comfortable I am with somebody who is currently streaming BDSM. Um, let's be clear, I am not in any way opposed to kink community, but I don't necessarily want to send my uh, viewers over there. No, Naruto, this is not an 18 plus stream. Um, the fairy tales and stories that I tell here are something that are applicable to all ages. And I myself, despite having some rather interesting quirks of my voice, am not a particularly lewd person. Um, so it makes more sense to me to keep my audience open and make sure that... Oh, they just ended. Okay. Uh, let me see what I can do here, though. Um... Well, heck, my whole darn thing seems to have decided it doesn't want to work. Um, <laughs> were you planning on something 18 plus there, Naruto? Alright, um... So, as far as things go here, uh, once again, thank you to everyone. I don't currently have much in the way of socials. Um, but I would like to try and find something that I think can be reasonably uh, chill here. I do see a few different people that are currently online. Um... You know what? I, I think I might know somebody who I can raid here. Uh, yes, B, stream is just kind of toward the... Uh, we're just getting on to the last piece. I'm trying to decide who to raid. Uh, do you have a particular target in mind? Lewd comments that I make. Kefri, do you really think I make lewd comments? <sighs> hey now, don't be bonking B. B is a cutie. At any rate, um, I think we will be, oh, why is it not letting me do this? I am having trouble getting the raid to work tonight, um, so I'm going to leave that up to my inexperience, and I apologize to anybody who is looking forward to, well, let's see if I can do this.
All right. It looks like the raid is set up. So uh, anybody who is interested, uh, Fox is currently uh, doing a Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom playthrough. Uh, so people who are trying to avoid spoilers for that should probably hop out. Um, other than that, though, thank you all for joining me. Have a wonderful time. I appreciate you listening to the stories and earlier in the evening the terms of service for twitch and hope everybody has a delightful time zone wherever you are goodbye